The Maryland Terrapins are coming to town and given our history <laughs> with the Terrapins should be a good afternoon for Penn Staters. Yeah, the Terps haven't scored a touchdown against the Nittany Lions in four years. This time they have their first string quarterback. Well, Penn State just needs to win and recapture that winning feeling. The Blue White Tailgate presented by Blaze Alexander is next. Welcome, everyone, to the Blue White Tailgate presented by Blaze Alexander, Steve J. Todd. The only time Penn State had the ball in the game with a chance to tie or take the lead was actually their opening drive because <laughs> eventually they fell back 14 0. Hard to play uphill. Especially as a defense that can do as much as they do and an offense as explosive as they are. You're always trying to catch up, and, uh, but you know. On to next week. There are some teams you can spot 14 points. Ohio State is yeah. not one of those teams. And with that kind of atmosphere, without the help of the crowd, without the help of some of that juice and that energy, it was just it was, it was an uphill battle all day long. By the way, still to come on the show, uh, we have for you Matt Millen a little bit later, the film room a little bit later. But now we're going to take a look at the game on Saturday night. And for James Franklin, every time something went right, then something else didn't follow up time you know we would we would get it going on offense we would we would give up something on defense and our defense would get a stop and then our offense you know wouldn't it's you know based on the qu question earlier we, we just really weren't playing complimentary football and that's going to be an issue all the parts have to work together especially when you're facing a, a finely tuned machine yeah and you know i gotta give credit where credit's due Despite the fact that we were having some trouble, the cardboard cutout fans stayed to the very end. They were in it. They were a good part of that atmosphere. I got to give them credit. Yeah, it was it was just so strange, wasn't it? I mean, you know, and, and you think oh, 100,000 people, would, Halloween night would have been a great, but, but it wasn't. And, you know, it just yeah. wasn't what was presented to them. And I was a little surprised they didn't control the line of scrimmage a little better. They, yeah. they got beat on both sides. And when that happens, boy, it's, it's just really difficult to try and do what you want to do. Well, Kenny Scherlinger is not a cardboard cutout. He has our <laughs> update desk. Following Penn State's 38-25 loss to Ohio State, they dropped to 0-2. The last time the Penn State Nittany Lions were 0-2 was back in 2012 under Bill O'Brien when they reeled off five straight victories to secure a second spot in the Big Ten Leaders Division. As we head the Lions in the league, the Denver Broncos will have to send a thank you letter to the Lash Football Building, as Deshaun Hamilton led the way for the Broncos receiving core with four catches for 82 yards in one touchdown. Rookie K.J. Hamler hauled in a game-winning touchdown against the Chargers as well, with no time remaining. And Bears wide receiver Allen Robinson II pulled down six catches for 87 yards and one touchdown in a tough loss for Chicago against the Saints. Penn State and Maryland will kick it off at 3.30 on the Big Ten Network. James Franklin looking to get yet another win against Maryland, a team that he is very familiar with after he spent eight seasons in two different stints as an assistant coach in College Park. Steve? All right, Kenny, so there you go. By the way, that was a lot of wide receiver talent on that yeah, screen there, by the way. You noticed that? That's and Chris awesome. Godwin wasn't even on the screen. I he know. Wait till he gets back. Yeah, wait till he gets back. All right, so let's take a look at the Penn State Maryland series to this point. We pretty much know how it's played out. We've seen it you know, in terms of the numbers between Penn State and Maryland over time. Look, Penn State just needs to keep that going. And there's another key part to this. I mean, they just need to go into a locker room and feel good, Todd. Well, and a lot of that's going to be get off to a good start. Um, you know, look, trust the game plan, control the line of scrimmage, do some things, get yourself not behind the chains, uh, pick up some first downs, uh, splash plays, all the things they talk about wanting to do. They just need to execute some of that stuff and for some of it to happen in the first half. Sean Clifford, role of a leader. He talks what they need to do attitude-wise pushing forward. This is a winning program with an 0-2 start. We're going to get back on track. We're going to work even harder this week. That's after the game. Okay, that was that's not him thinking about it. And it's Wednesday, so you're you know you know you're a quarterback coach along the way. Your quarterback says something like that after the game. What does that tell you? It tells you that he is taking it upon himself. That he's got some leadership ability, and I think uh, it's going to be imperative that Penn State does some things early in the game to get him into a flow, get him in a rhythm, 
and take what Maryland's given him. Some, there's going to be some opportunities there. But I think if he can, if he can, uh, if he can get started, I think they'll be in good shape. And you talked about feeling that winning, right? I mean, he can yeah. say we're a winning program, <clears throat> and all those guys know it. But it's that that being ahead. The feeling of the winning, the confidence that that builds, and you know it's going to be imperative. Because look, all is not lost. I mean, you know they've got a chance to make a run here, and look, it's Ohio State and everybody else in the Big Ten. So you can still sure. be the second best team in the Big Ten, but it's got to start this weekend against Maryland. Exactly, you've got to start. You know this is your line in the sand. Now move forward with it, and that's what they need to do. All right, coming up. Well, we talked about Sean Clifford, so we're going to stick with the Penn State offense. We're going to talk about them in the next segment. Later in the show, Matt Millen will join us from BTN as we continue with Blue White Tailgate presented by Blaze Alexander after this. Welcome back to the Blue White Tailgate presented by our good friends at Blaze Alexander. Uh, game two out now with this offense. Jay, you know this better than anybody. Is there a break-in period for when you're putting a new offense in? Yeah, I think what you find out is not only is there a break, break, break in period with the players learning the new system, but there's also an element of a new offense coordinator getting familiar with all the guys and what they can do. I think we're going to see a lot more of that against Maryland because I think they'll be able to do some of the things that they map out and say, we'd like to do this and might have some more success with that that they didn't have against Indiana and against Ohio State because we really haven't seen the identity of Coach Sharaka's offense quite yet. You see some remnants. You see yeah. some things that are familiar from past years from what he did at Minnesota. I think it's going to really start to reveal itself a little bit more coming Well, up. revealing himself to everybody with his great talent on the field was <laughs> Jahan Dotson. He's our Offensive Player of the Week. He had eight catches for 144 yards in this game and three touchdowns and was just absolutely outstanding. The, the 144 is a career high, the eight catches. Not only that, acrobatic catches, which we'll get to in a few moments because, because you know, he was something else in this game. In fact, Kenny Scherlinger takes a look at – I don't know all eight, but a couple that really stood out, Kenny. Steve, Jahan Dotson was one of the bright spots for the Penn State offense in their tough loss against Ohio State. Reeling in catch after catch, touchdown after touchdown. And he talked about postgame, how each and every target for him is so important. Every time the ball's in the air, it's, it's a chance for you to make a name for yourself, for you to put the team on your back or whatever it is. So I, I think of it every time the ball's in the air, it's a million dollars. and We got to go cash in. That's what I did today. Early in the fourth quarter against Ohio State, the Nittany Lions needed a spark, and Dotson provided that with back-to-back -back circus catches with a second snag going for a much-needed touchdown. And even though Penn State's receivers aren't allowed to make one-handed catches in practice, Dotson looked like a seasoned pro using one paw to haul in the pigskin. I kind of have to practice that after practice just because the, the coaches prohibit that at practice. Uh, it's two hands every, every, every time you get an opportunity to catch the ball, so... Penn State's quarterback Sean Clifford spoke about Jahan's determination to be their Forge quarterback throughout last week. And going into this week, he said he told me he's like he's like like bro, I got you. Like I really want to, I, I want to make sure that you know, like I'm going to give it my all, and you know how hard we've been working. And Todd, I got to give you credit. Up in the press box on Saturday, you turned to me after that first circus catch by Jahan Dotson and said they got to throw it up to him and the other receivers more and make them have an opportunity to go up and make some plays. Dotson made that play, that one-handed snag to get into the end zone. And, Todd, I think maybe you should work your way over from the press box to the coach's booth next week. Uh, I'm fine and comfortable where I'm at. Thank you, Kenny. I appreciate that. But, you know, there's a sense of that. I mean, you couldn't see the second catch coming, of course, the one-handed grab. But there's a sense that, and I love the conversation that Jahan had with Sean to say, I got you. Because as a quarterback with new receivers around you, you need to have that trust level. And, not, and especially against Ohio State, you don't have the luxury of, of waiting till your guy is open. You have to trust the guy, go up and execute and let them make some plays. And also, you know, there's a lot of times where coaches will want to run to set up the pass. Sometimes there's games you need to pass to set up the run. Yeah. And that really loosened up. You saw Sean actually had some space to run in the second half when he called a draw here and there because of what Jahan Dotson did and what, what some of the other receivers can do. So thanks, Kenny. I'll pay you later. But, uh, <laughs> but it was just that sense, you know, because we saw that in 2016 yeah. and with Trace yeah. and with some of his receivers. He needs to get to that trust level. No question. And I think, you know, if, if there's one criticism that you might have had in Sean in week one, it was he may have been locked on to, to Friar Muth a little too much, and sure. this gives him somebody else to go to.
Dotson was talking to Jack Ham and me after the game, and I asked him about the one-handed catch. And he said, Steve, if I dropped that one, I would have had to do 200 <laughs> push-ups. <laughs> so he made it pay off. But Parker Washington has stepped up. It looks like Keandre Lambert-Smith. So he's starting to maybe round into a wide receiver core now, and not just Fryermuth, not just Dotson. It looks like they've got other parts now. Part of that is the quick release. They took advantage of some crossing routes, some slants. He had a little bit of quick throws to get it out, to get build that confidence. He's not getting and hit there's not a guy right in his face and and you know doing things to let those guys shake their defender to get open they weren't creating a lot of separation for some of that part of it so you saw the passing game developing you saw it starting to develop and look they were down 14 to nothing and they outscored them technically the rest of the way so there's some confidence to take from that Buckeyes game and you know we'll see what happens as it moves forward so now we're going to see those parts coming to play with our Sign Stop Drive of the Game, brought to you by our good friends at the Sign Stop. And uh, those parts come into play here. Penn State's down 21-6, initial drive, second half. Parker Washington, Exhibit A right there. Now, Keandre Lambert-Smith, Exhibit B right there. The ability to spread the ball around, and then finally when he needs to go in the end zone, Dotson on the end cut makes the touchdown catch. Penn State gets a two, gets a two for none. The field goal at the end of the half, the drive to start the second half, they go from 21-3 down to 21-13, but again, they still fell behind by two scores eventually. Yeah, and thank goodness Ohio State, did, that Justin Fields is not a math major because they didn't count <laughs> down very well no. before the half. That was one of the strangest things yeah. I've seen in a long time. Weird. Really weird. And credit to you, Steve. You mentioned that they backed off, right? I mean, and, and they, yeah. they recognized that. And, you know, Jay, you were talking about Penn State recognized that, and they started to take advantage of those, those plays, those quick throws to, to move the ball and, and, and put together some drives in the second half. All right, let's go to Tale of the Tape, brought to you by CP Vets. That's where Todd brings all of his animals. Mm -hmm. CP Vets, tale of the tape, Penn State, Maryland. Let's take a look at the Penn State offense and the Maryland defense, okay? And the Maryland defense has really struggled at times this year. But for Sean Clifford, remember, Maryland has scored in their opening drive, and there's the numbers right there. Maryland has scored in its opening drive in each of the first two games. Penn State scored in its opening drive against Indiana. Sean Clifford says they need to open fast and then keep it going in the first half. we got to... You gotta jump off, jump out early, uh, early and often. Um, you know, similar to last week, you know, we had a touchdown drive, and nothing. So we gotta, we gotta figure it out in the first half for sure. Part of that's first down, guys. Uh, Penn State had 28 first down plays in the game. They had 14 runs, 14 passes. The 14 runs netted 34 yards. But you take out Devin Ford's 23-yard run, that's 13 plays, 11 yards, Jay. They need more on first down. Yeah, they got to stay ahead of the schedule and, uh, and make sure that their third downs are third and ones and third and twos. And, uh, you know, that's going to be a key. Which the then brings in Devin Ford. Sure. Yes, and the tail of the tape full screen said 293 rushing yards that Maryland has allowed. Yeah. If the offensive line, and they can't get more, down, more yards on first down this week, then they really have some issues. And, and so some of the things that you guys were just discussing should not go away, but should be solved on, on first down this, this weekend. And Maryland has registered one sack defensively so far in two games. Sean Clifford needs time. He could get it. Oh, I think he'll get time, and, and Maryland's going to play off a little bit, so he'll have those quick throws available to him as well. So that's important. Now, what about the Penn State defense? We'll talk about them and what they need to do in this game to slow down Talia Tunga-Viola, Jake Funk, and company. I'm the one that has to say it all night. You guys <laughs> yeah. don't have to. Back with more after this. Blue White Tailgate presented by Blaze Alexander. All right, welcome back. We're going to talk about defense now for Penn State. And it seemed like, especially the first couple of drives, they just they, they weren't in sync, especially with what Ohio State was trying to do. Well, Ohio State came right at them and they wanted to see if yep. they could run north and south, and they had some success doing it. And then I thought the other thing was, uh, you know, once Penn State settled in, they were able to contain some of the big plays. But Ohio State, you know, their credit made some great catches and some great plays against against that defense. You go 60 plus yards on the first play on a jet sweep, and they're immediately on their heels. And then the touchdown Lave had, you know, when it's completely covered, and that's just superior everything yeah. that's involved with it, from Fields to Lave, and even the coverage, and they still score. You just throw your hands up and go. Oh, and now, 
boom, they, they've taken the first two punches, right? And it was just that was the way the game got set up. And those first two punches were with Jesse Lucchetta not on the field because he didn't play the first yeah. half of the game. So Jesse Lucchetta, with eight tackles in the second half, ended up being our defensive player of the week. Once he got out there, he had fresh legs and he had energy. And that made and also he's also critical, by the way, guys, in the communication on this defense. He and Ellis Brooks both. So they lost a communicator out there, which did not help. Yeah, no question. And you know, I I think we talked about it before the season started. I thought he was gonna be a real major cog in this defense and, and really a chance in some ways to be better at that position than we were a year ago. I mean, look. You're playing Ohio State. All hands have to be on deck, and they didn't have that. And that's something you do. It's not the primary reason, obviously. Not there are other factors as well, but he would have helped. Right, and it plays into the slow start because we, yeah. we, I think we all agree that the slow start was a primary reason why that guy, game got away from them, or they just were never able to catch up. And, of course, Justin Fields also. We showed the video, yeah. and he almost got knocked down, and the guy's athletic enough to stay up. Instead of a seven-yard loss, that turns into a first down. You know, So those kinds of things just happen. But, of course, it would have helped to have had number 40 out there. And it's the interesting, Ty, because you mentioned in a previous answer about Joey Porter Jr. and the coverage mm -hmm. on Olave, you know, they went at him, and he held up for the most part, I thought, pretty well. Yeah, I mean, maybe a little bit of a slow start. I mean, that yeah. particular play was, was fantastic coverage, and they just they, that happens sometimes. I mean, how many times do you see that play where they don't catch it, but it's a penalty on the defender? I mean, he did not commit a penalty on the play. The guy just happened to still reel it in. But I know you had mentioned, Jay, he started off a little slow, but you were yeah, impressed right. with what he did after that. Yeah, they went after him. Again, you, take, you pick your poison. Am I going to go right. after Fields or am I going to go after Joey right. Porter Jr.? He's the young guy. I'll see what he can do. Exactly. And they did have some success with him early, but he made some adjustments and made some plays in the second half. And I think one of the other things that was really strong was he made a lot of one-on-one -on -one tackles. Yeah. When they threw the ball short, he came up and made a tackle. Uh, Brandon Smith, by the way, in the game, after uh, being shut out tackle-wise in the opener at five, a sack in the game, one and a half tackles for losses. Now let's get to the tale of the tape presented by CP Vets. All right. And when you look at the tale of the tape, uh, the Penn State defense and, hey, look, the Maryland offense has generated some points. You know, Which one's going to show up? That's yeah, the big question. The one that scored three or the one that scored 45? Nobody knows. Yeah, 45, yeah. yeah. You know, the interesting thing, they hadn't scored a point in the second or third quarter. They didn't, in the second or third quarter yeah. against Minnesota, they didn't score. Wow. They scored 21 in the first. Then all of a sudden they remember what they did in the first and did in the fourth, and then in overtime, it's crazy. Uh, it really yeah, was. Yeah, and that 37 on the tail of the tape sticks out. Do you want to throw out your 1899 no, stat? No, I'm not going to throw no, that one, out. Throw that one <laughs> out. I was not alive then. Steve I, may have, I think yeah. Steve called one of those yeah. games. I, I, I did with the Duquesne Athletic yeah. Club. Yeah, that was me. Good, yeah. good crew. They've given up 35 <laughs> too many times in a row, 35 plus. And I think that's going to start to get corrected, obviously, as we get a little deeper into the into the schedule. But that's alarming to see 37 points the, the first couple of games. That means yeah. that's a lot of points you got to score to win the game. Game. So. And look, you're going to need help from everybody in this, including the safeties. James Franklin was asked about the safety play earlier this week. You know, obviously, when you, when you go back and you watch that tape and you talk to and you talk to Coach Banks and and you talk about the production that we've had at the, at the safety position, uh, not just at that position, but really across the board uh, at every position, I, I think we are, we're capable of playing at a higher level. And they'll need that. I mean, I mean, not just this week, but I mean, moving forward, you're going to need that consistency at that last line of defense. Yeah, well, look, before the season, there was a lot of talk about this secondary being one of the better ones mm -hmm. in a long time. Well, you know, it's time now for them to put up and, and show that that's the case. And we just mentioned, we've, we all feel they're well-equipped on the corners, right? I mean, yeah. if, if, if they're going to pick on Joey Porter, who's obviously a talented guy, that means there's a lot of respect for Tariq Castro-Fields. And so the safety help has to be there to make the secondary whole. Yeah, and uh, I know you asked about the touchdown pass, the second one to Olave, where he yeah. reaches out and just makes a great play. And you asked me where the safety help was in that. Yeah. Like, I'm supposed to know? Yeah. <laughs> that's the main question. It was rhetorical. Okay. There wasn't an answer for it. I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> All right, so coming up, uh, still to come on the show, Matt Millen. We'll talk with him. He'll do the game with Lisa Byington this week on BTN. And the film room is coming up next. Jay will delve in and break down some tape and take one of your questions in a moment on Blue White Tailgate after this. Welcome back to Blue White Tailgate and welcome into the film room, Kenny Scherlinger, Jay Paterno, 
Maryland, Penn State. Penn State's done well against Maryland. And I mean, I, <laughs> well is you, name it. Yeah. <laughs> you name it. So let's start off with this Maryland offense. They got two of two out there, yeah. his little brother. Uh, so what are the Terrapins looking like on offense here? Well, let's talk about that because they go from three points against Northwestern is a really good defensive football and hit him 45 points. So let's get into some of the basic things that you at home want to be looking for come Saturday. One of them is the RPO. Now, everybody talks about the RPO over and over and over again, and, and they're going to run it. They'll read linebackers. They'll read a bunch of other things. But they'll also read safeties, and Penn State likes to get their safeties involved. And when they come off that fake, that safety comes down, they're going to try and sneak that post in behind them. If you take a look at the video, you'll see how this works out for them. Again, nice hard fake. They're block and run. They have a chance. Their running back has had a really good game Friday night. So you got to play that, and there's the safety, and right in behind them goes the post. So, again, one of those things you got to look for. They also do a little different version of it, what I call a quarterback RPO now. Now they're going to show a screen pass to the front side. He's going to look out there. If he has the screen reading these guys, now he's going to, he's going to throw the screen. If he doesn't have the screen, if the whole defense flows over there, now he's going to run backside. He's also got a hitch outside he wants to throw it. So let's take a look at the, the video on this. And I think one thing that's different about them this year offensively is they have a quarterback who is healthy, who's got the ability to do these things and can go get himself 15, 20 yards and move the chains. The other thing that they're going to do to Penn State is their, their run game, they like to get inside with pull and kick out. And with Penn State playing wide defensive ends, they're going to be susceptible to that, which then puts pressure on the linebackers when there is some separation. So take a look at the video on that. You'll see the backside guard and the backside uh, tight end off the ball come out, kick out, and they get their running back going north and south. And that's where he's really at his most dangerous because if you're spread out a little bit, and your safety takes a little bit of a bad angle, he can suddenly make it a good, a good big play for him. The other thing they've done a nice job is they have not given up a lot of sacks. Part of it is they do a nice job up front against the blitz with that offensive line, and they get the ball out quickly. And that can be frustrating for a defense, but take a look at, at how they do this here. You're going to see a blitz come on the video. You're going to see a blitz come late. They pick it up. They get the ball out in a hurry, and now he makes a play, breaks a tackle, and now turns into a touchdown. And Penn State on the outside is going to have to make those tackles one-on-one. -on -one. Now, let's take a look about, talk about their defense a little bit. They've had a lot of problems on defense. They've given up a lot of points that we talked about. Why is that? Number one, up front, uh, opposing offensive lines have done a nice job of creating movement up front and causing them to lose their gap uh, integrity. So when you see this, you're going to see on this run play, Minnesota's going to move that offensive line up front. The safety's going to come up and they're going to lose their gap. So take a look at the video on this one. And when those kind of things happen, that's when you get big plays. And hopefully for Penn State on, on Saturday afternoon, they'll be able to create that movement, get the ball north and south, and make some big plays. The other thing you want to look for on Saturday as well is the matchups with the wideouts. Again, Dotson had a great game. So, obviously, they're going to be very, very concerned about that. That means the other guys are going to have to do some one-on-one -on -one thing. Take a look at here when we look at this. You're going to see it out and up on this against their corner. They play a lot of off, which means they're susceptible to double moves. Here's a quick double move for them. Take a look at this on the video. And you'll see two shots of this. You'll see the, the, the wide shot. And then we'll have a nice shot of the, in, the isolation shot where you'll see the, the out and up on this one. And again, Penn State, if they have time up front, they'll have a chance to make those throws down the field. The last thing we'll talk about is when they get into, when they get into packing, the, packing the front up front, you're going to see eight guys around the ball. One of the things Penn State has got, to, has got to be able to do is take advantage of that when there's eight guys around the ball by getting the ball to their wideouts, getting people open downfield, and moving people up front uh, like Minnesota does. So let's take a look at this one on the video as well. Again, eight guys around the ball. They're going to try and jam things up. Their middle linebacker we talked about is, pretty, is an effective football player. If Penn State can get their linemen onto him and start to, start to move that line and get the linebackers, they're going to give Maryland a lot of problems. And that takes us to the question of the week. This one is from Ryan from Hershey, and it's a little bit different from last week with the film. Uh, he asks, how much did you pay the county to get the, the 4-9 and nine ballot yesterday? We saw your tweet. Okay, let's tell the story, and we'll show the tweet on the yeah. screen here. So I go to get, I go at 6:30 to vote on Tuesday. I get in line, and uh, it's by 7:05. I'm there, and 
I turn in my I turn in my ID and they look at it and they call it out and the guy yells the ballot number. I don't pay any attention. Next thing you know, she says Joseph Paterno, which is my given name, my birth name. She says Joseph Paterno, number four oh nine, and everybody in the room kind of stopped and went, "Wait, what?" And I said, "Did you just say four oh nine?" She goes, "Yeah, pretty creepy, isn't it?" So even though I was there early, I was not the four hundred ninth person to show up. But you know what? It's uh, if that's the least controversy we have this week at the election, then we're all good with that. So it could be a good omen for whoever you voted for, or possibly for Penn State coming up this week against uh, Maryland. So we'll I see think, how that goes. I think it's a good omen for football because, <laughs> look, like, let's stick to football and not get into this, but I think it's going to be a good week, good Saturday afternoon for Penn State and Beaver Stadium. And I think the cardboard fans will leave happy. And as a reminder, make sure you send in your questions and you can win a book, uh, or a new copy of uh, Jay's new book, Hot Seat. Thank you for joining us on the film room. We wrap up Blue Light Tailgate when we come back. Welcome back, right there, the Lewis Blue White Tailgate, presented by our good friends at Blaze Alexander. So now let's get to it with uh, Maryland, and let's delve into the series. I think everybody knows you know where the series has gone. And Mike Loxley is their head coach into his second full season as the head coach. Uh, the record won't wow you, but his time at Alabama wowed Maryland enough to say this is the guy to go with. Yeah, and I think that his history as a recruiter in that area, yep. they're looking for a guy with some roots to try and get you know, get those kids to stay home. And they've had some success in the recruiting trail. Now it's got to translate into the wins and losses. Well, they're trying to lock it up, right, Loxley? They're trying to lock up the DMV area where they yeah. can keep their talent Wait, home. Are seriously using that? I think so. Oh, and, you know, one of the funny things, at least the images that come from last year, it was a Friday night game. We all remember it. They shut down the school early. There's this massive game at on, on the stand. And the Penn State students took over yeah. the student section yeah. at the end. I mean, it got out of hand quickly for Maryland. So, uh, you know, look, Penn State's a big rival for Maryland, whether or not Penn State realizes that. Mm -hmm. And it's obviously been one sided hammer and the nail, but they need a better showing against yeah. the Nittany Lions, or there will be a lot of grumbling down in College Park about the way that it's handled. I mean, they had a three and nine season. They're going to give the guy a little bit of rope, mm -hmm. but you know, you got to put up a better performance against well, Penn State if you coach at Maryland. I'll say this, they're feeling better about themselves this week. Talia Tunga Viola stepped up last week after throwing for three touchdowns, 94 yards first game. Look at those eye popping numbers. That's how you end up being the Big Ten co offensive player of the week. And uh, they got off to a great start, not much in the middle. I mean, they, they played it, what I call a donut game, yeah. right? First, fourth, middle, zero. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> no points in those scores. But, you know, they, they've got a run game established on Friday night. Last yes. Friday night, they got. And that enabled him to do some other things with the RPO and everything. And uh, he, he handled it really, really well. Yeah. Well, look, it is to his younger brother, Tunga yep. Vailoa. I know you're going to say it a million times. I'll hand yeah. it off to you. But, look, Penn State just faced – you mentioned he was co-offensive player of the week. The other guy they just faced. <laughs> yes. Justin Fields was the co-offensive player of the week. Now they face the other one. And I think the play that stood out to me against Minnesota the most was that Minnesota had him boxed yes. in – circled around and sprint it yeah. down the field for the touchdown. So this is another guy very, very dangerous with his feet. And you've got to assume Penn State's pass rush is going to get to the backfield. Yeah. So I think it's really going to be key the way he handles that pass rush and how quickly and how much he, he gashes them or hopefully doesn't gash them with his feet. Two is left-handed, Talia is right-handed, and James Franklin is impressed by the right-handed version. I thought he played extremely well. You watch that, that – you know, that Minnesota game, it's, it's hard not to be impressed. You look at the completion percentage, uh, you look at uh, the decision making, you look at his ability to make plays with his feet um, as well as extend plays in the pocket. Um, it was impressive. And he got help in the running game. Jake Funk, whose dad played here at Penn State, his grandfather played basketball here at Penn State, his aunt and uncle were part of the athletic athletic program here. I think it went in rifle here at Penn State. He had two twenty one. Yeah, there used to be there used to be a riflery range in the basement yes. of uh, White Building. But yes, obviously a guy like that 
Had a great game Friday night. Yeah. Really runs hard. Yeah. Runs north and south, but also can get outside. But I think the other thing, he's going to have a little extra motivation to play in this game. No question. You know, and this is a guy who's been derailed by injuries. He had an ACL a couple of years ago, and he looked really good the other night. And I mentioned that game last year. You know these players that have a lot of pride in what's going on. Funk's a kid from Maryland. A lot of the kids yeah. we talk about are from Maryland. They're going to want to have some pride in, in what happened and come out. And now, look, we assume he's going to get hit a little bit more at the line yeah. of scrimmage as opposed to making it yeah. seven, eight yards downfield before anybody touches them. But they're a powerful kid, and if they're going to go yeah. three, four yards, try and control the clock, time yeah. of possession, you know, that, that's the way they're going to approach this game. I mean, good receivers, Dante Jones, Jayshon Jones, Daryl Jones. I mean, you go through uh, Brian Cobbs, whose dad Duffy played here at Penn State. In fact, his knockdown on the two-point conversion with 14 against seconds Maryland. to go is legendary against Maryland, <laughs> which will be almost th – it's 34 years to the day on Sunday. We actually hit that two-point conversion on, as a scout team member in practice. Ah. And when they lined up, everybody knew it was coming, and Duffy made a great play. And Duffy really made a great career. He really did, and spent a little bit of time with the Patriots. Uh, defensively, though, Latez Rogers, he gets pressure. Campbell, the middle linebacker, is a really good player. Nick Cross, the safety, is a really good player. But they haven't put it together totally as a defense tackle. Well, we say all the time when we're, you know, Penn State's facing a team like Ohio State, you better tackle well, right? Yeah. Uh, for Maryland, yeah. they had better tackle well because they don't have the same kind of athletes all over the roster. They have some, but Penn State will hurt them with the big play if they do not tackle well in this game. There's no question about that. It's going to be really important, especially in a game like this. Camp, again, Campbell's the kind of guy, middle linebacker, I'm impressed with. I mean, he, he, he makes plays for them. Plays awfully hard, and that's yes, the key thing. really I mean, hard. And, and he's a smart football player. He's where he's supposed to be, and he finishes the tackles. And if you have those three things, you're going to make a lot of plays, and, that, and he's going to have to. And a guy that has made a lot of plays in his lifetime and now announces a lot of plays <laughs> in, a, in a new life is Matt Millen. He'll join us. He'll be on the call for BTN on Saturday at Beaver Stadium. We'll talk with Matt as we continue with more after this. Welcome back to Blue White Tailgate presented by Blaze Alexander, Steve Jones, Jay Paterno, Todd Sadowski, and joined now by Matt Millen from BTN. Matt, let's get to the single most important question that everybody thinks about, at least I know I do, before we get to football. How are you? Oh, I'm doing. I'm doing well. I've I've been very fortunate with this. Um, this because I really haven't. I've, it's kind of been a breeze. I went in and they changed my heart, and I walked out like an oil change. So <laughs> <laughs> I've been pretty good. <laughs> how many miles do you get, Matt? It's James Turner. That's how many, a great question. How many miles yeah. before you have to get an oil change out of that heart? No. Uh, uh. But uh, look, all kidding aside, you know, as you look at the college offenses that you're seeing, and you're seeing them week in, week out, you know, Penn State plays a spread team with Ohio State, and, and another one coming in. As you look at Maryland, you know, what kind of things are you seeing in terms of the challenges they'll present to Penn State's defense? Yeah, it's interesting because, you know, you can look at all these different offenses and you try to categorize them in one thing, and they're really a bunch of things. And so while they spread people out, they'll still, you know, they'll – They'll run the option game. They'll do the RPOs. There's still an element of power football in there sometimes. There's still, you know, sometimes they line up in uh, you know, single back stuff. Sometimes they line up in I formation. So it's a lot of different things. But um, in the end, it still comes down to just trying to spread the field. And I think that's what's, uh, that's what all the football has gone to. And so they've placed more of a premium on um, – they've gone to more athleticism. Um, and so actually it puts – more pressure to me when I watch college football where you really see the deficiency as an offensive lineman. And so they, you know, they still want to get bigger guys, but they have smaller guys on the other side running off the edge and running around in the, in the uh, second level in the linebacker spot. So I think that's the biggest, biggest thing that I've seen in college football, and it, it, it's gone on into pro football as well. Uh, Matt, Jay mentioned the RPOs. Um, have, yeah. You know, they had trouble against Ohio State with that in the first half, including one time where the guy tackled both the quarterback and the running back. Um, so talk about how defenses are defending that specifically. Are they catching up to that a little bit and, and disguising how they are covering the RPOs? Yeah, and it's different based on your personnel. And so, yeah, when you have a more talented group, you know, the old thing was when they would run the old option when – when we were playing it, um, and that's what you tried to do is get them both. And, you know, there was always that mesh point 
that they would always try to, you know, read off of. And so you just tried to take the running back right into the quarterback. And sometimes it worked, and, and you know, most of the time it didn't, but that was the aim. Um, now, you know, the, the reads are coming from different places. So, as Jay could tell you, the RPO thing is a little bit different. Sometimes they read a defensive end, sometimes a defensive tackle, sometimes a linebacker, sometimes off a of safety. It depends uh, on a lot of different variables, um, but essentially it's the same thing. And so um, it really comes down to the personnel you have offensively doing the thing. The real, it still comes down to decision-making with the quarterback and also the defender. So, you know, sometimes you get a, a little more athletic guy that you're trying to run it off of, and it, it's not as successful. And sometimes, you know, they make mistakes. And so really that's, that's what you're running it off of. Uh, Matt, some uh, conferences obviously have fans. The Big Ten is not having fans this season. Now, for Jack Ham and me, the one point when they ran out through the tunnel, I felt like Harry Doyle in Major League. <laughs> <laughs> you know, as, they're running, as they're running out onto the field. So what's it been like, A, for you to be in those kind of atmospheres, but also what has it meant for offenses on the road that they don't have to deal with it? Well, I think that's a positive for when you're on the road because you can communicate really well. I mean, really, honestly, to me, the most annoying thing in the games right now is that fake crowd noise they yeah. pump in. And yeah. some places they have it really loud that you can't even really hear through your headset. And, uh, and uh, last week it was down a little bit. And so I enjoy hearing all that stuff. I love listening to the calls. Um, and I, uh, if you can, you'd, you know, I'd like to hear the stuff at the line of scrimmage, but they kind of turn the, the stuff, uh, the crowd <laughs> noise up a little bit. Yeah. Uh, it's different. It's different, but, hey, look, it's what it is. So that's mm -hmm. what you have to deal with. And so that's the way the game's played right now. You do have to bring your own energy. You are going to have to, uh, you know, ad adapt and overcome. That's, that's why you play. Matt, uh, you know, it's been a while since you played, but – Tell, give us one memory or something that you really hold on to when you look back at Penn State. One game or one moment, maybe it's senior day, whatever it is. Just give us something that, that you hold on to. For Penn State, honestly, it's, it still comes down to the guys you played with, the coaches you were under. You know, I have very, very fond memories of your dad. You know, I have, there's arguments in there. And there's getting kicked off the fields in there. But there's hey, you got off light, Matt. There. I got kicked off a lot worse than you did yeah, in the house. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, I mean, but look, I, I, this, is, this is just what I think. And so um, when I think back to Penn State, I think about the guys I played with. And then I also think about our coaching staff. And so, you know, I think about JT. Uh, yeah. So JT White was, a, was uh, the guy who called and he, uh, coached me, and he was – the guy was very – now, you people who know him won't, uh, won't understand this, but JT was really fun to be around in a JT sort of way. Yep. <laughs> he yes. would say the, some of the things you'd look at him like, what are you – what language is that? <laughs> <laughs> you didn't have any idea. And your dad – you know, your dad was consistent. Your dad was strong. Your dad was – you know, he was definitive. I like that. Yeah. That's, you know, you can argue with him. That's fine. He loved the great argument, as you well know. But he was, you know, he was a guy that he was the face of the program for years, and he ran tremendous programs. So th that's the stuff that I think about, not necessarily games. You know, if I, I guess if I had to pick a game, I, I would probably just right off the top of my head, the first game that pops into my head is the 78 Sugar Bowl. Yeah. And, uh, and I remember it, how, you know, devastating it was. At the time, you just think, you know, I can't believe we couldn't get in from the one-yard line. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and then, and then, it's, then it's gone. It's football. It's, you know, it was, it was a great time. Always great work. Always great to hear from you. Matt, all the best. Can't wait to have you here this weekend. You got it, guys. Look forward to seeing you. Take care of yourself. Yeah. Thanks, All right, man. we'll come back. Good, bad, the ugly as we continue after this. So when you close out a segment with Matt Millen and you quickly promote the good, the bad, and the ugly, you'd better get to it right away. <laughs> the good, the bad, and the ugly. Maybe a little late, 
<laughs> but here we go. Jay, you get the good. This is easy. Dan Mullen, full Darth <laughs> Vader costume after the game. I Look, I don't want to get the controversy of the, the fight and whatever it is, but, I mean, the guy obviously prepped. He had the helmet. Yeah. He had the lightsaber. He had it all. Got to hand it to him. The bad will be the fight. <laughs> I'll go with that. I'll go with the fight. Uh, and Mullen got fined $25,000 when it was all said and done. Not for the costume, though. No. Not for the costume. Todd. So the ugly is Nebraska. Uh, why are they so rebellious? You're in the Big Ten now. Can you just, you know, have a little empathy? They're so concerned about Wisconsin and their COVID cases that, you know, no empathy. They go, okay, well, we can't play Wisconsin. Can we play UT Chattanooga? No, you can't have fans, says the Big Ten. No, you got to play Big Ten teams. They're trying to keep this thing in yeah. somewhat of a Big Ten bubble, yeah. okay? I think they need to worry about winning their games in the conference more so than playing games outside of conference. Athletic director at UTC at Chattanooga, Mark Wharton, who was head of the Nittany Lion Club here for years. <laughs> so there's a Penn State connection in this. Everywhere there's Penn State right. connection. Did, did Purdue call him this week or not? I don't know. I uh, no he idea. Maybe Purdue. Yeah. <laughs> Suddenly UTC's like us. loading up on call getting us. quarter million Please. dollar checks. All right. So let's get to our picks. First of all, the standings. Oh, oh! Look, there's a big tie for the lead. Oh, uh, look who's in last place. Yeah, it's exactly right. I'm picking the team. And still in I uniform, won. though. You're, oh, yeah, he's still in uniform. Well, first oh, of all, the number of wins for the season matches the jersey. There you go. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> so, and it may be that way this week. Yeah, this we'll week find too. out. <laughs> I, I've got Indiana, Michigan to start out. Now everybody's wondering how good is Indiana. I think people are wondering how good is Michigan. I'm going to stay on the Indiana train. I'm going to go with that and stay with it. Todd, what do you think? Welcome to 2020 to the <laughs> Pac-12, Stanford <laughs> at Oregon, where we have no idea how good any of these teams are. That's right. But Oregon's at home, and they're supposed to be good. I'm going with Oregon. Let's take it over to Kenny. Thank you, Todd. As we head down to the Sunshine State for the world's largest outdoor cocktail party between Florida and Georgia. I'm going with the Gators in this one. They're looking for their first win in the series since 2016, and I think they get it. After Georgia's been banged up a little bit with injuries, they just squeaked by Kentucky last week. So I'm taking the Gators and a close one down there in Jacksonville. Jay, you got a big one. What do you got? Thanks, Kenny. I've got Clemson at Notre Dame. Now, Trevor Lawrence is out. Thankfully, Steve doesn't have to call this game because there's another very tricky name uh, at quarterback Clemson. But he played really well last week against BC, brought him back. Travis Etienne, all the other guys at Clemson, I think they've got too much for Notre Dame. No, it would be a lot of great play by DJ. Oh, DJ goes back yes. to pass. Yeah. There'd be no need. Yeah. <laughs> you got to be able to work your way around things like that. All right, time now for our Blaze Alexander Keys to the Game, brought to you by Blaze Alexander Family Dealerships. So, Todd, you get it rolling here. What are your keys for the game? I'm looking for one group, the offensive line. We talk about Sean Clifford or quarterbacks and people just needing confidence. I think it works the same way with the offensive line. If they can control the defensive line, they can get the running game going, get them in good schedules, and then protect Clifford so that he can be accurate and have another good second good game like he did in the second half against Ohio State. Yeah, I think you have to stay with the trenches on this thing, but I also want to flip it to another part. I think Penn State has not spent a lot of time this season playing with the lead. They had that 13-play, 64-yard drive, obviously against Indiana to open, then fell behind 17-7 in that game, fell behind against Ohio State. I think they need to get to the lead, play with the lead, because I think that's a different mentality than playing uphill. I'm going to say play a clean game, and what I mean yeah. by that is get in and out of the huddle, you know, get your defense on and off the field. Get your special teams. Really tie everything together so that you walk off that field feeling really confident and you're not, you don't have turnovers, you don't have stupid penalties. Again, too many of these late-hit yeah. type penalties. Let's just have a clean game. I think if you do that, you got better people in Maryland. And uh, I think you come out of it with a good win. All right, so Penn State goes for that first win, one they really need coming up Saturday at Beaver Stadium as they take on Maryland. Maryland comes in feeling pretty good about itself. We feel pretty good about ourselves. For Todd, <laughs> Jay, Kenny, I'm Steve. Thanks for joining us on Blue White Tailgate.